five, four, three, two, one. Hi, this is Brother Edie, and welcome to Engage 3.0. Joining me is my co-host, Brother Colin. Good evening, everyone. We're so glad to be back again in Engage 3.0. We are continuing in our series, The Sabbath, but we're going to be bringing it from a new aspect. We are going to be doing these video broadcasts. Now, you know, 2.0 dealt with more the audio or the podcasting. Although we're going to still be podcasting this, but we're just going to be bringing it now from a video aspect. So we hope that our viewers and listeners will be blessed. So before we go uh, any further in our topic today, which is the restoration of the Sabbath, we're going to turn over to Brother Colin to lead us into a word of prayer. Brother Colin? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for this opportunity for a new start and Engage 3.0, and as God leads us, we ask that God's Spirit be with us to encourage us and also to strengthen us. Let His Spirit give us the words to say and not our own words, and let the blessing of the Lord be on each listener and watching those who are watching. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're going to give all the pleasantries on the opposite end of this broadcast today, where you'll be able to find these programs. So let us go into our question and answer period for today. Question number one, as we look at the topic, the restoration of the Sabbath. God teaches in the Bible that the seventh day is the Sabbath. The fourth commandment says, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. So question number one, what is the attitude of God's people toward all the commandments of God. So let's look at it. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12. Revelation chapter 14 verse 12 says this. Here are the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandment of God and have the, test, have the faith of Jesus. The saints spoken of here are sanctified and holy without spot and blameless since the word saints is the same word that is in other places translated holy. Many who claim holiness repudiate anything that has to do with God's law. But not so with God. Those who are really holy, God says, will keep his commandments. You know, um, this reminds me of Romans chapter 7. And there's... Um, a verse in there that Paul talks about in that line. It says in Romans chapter 7, and we would like you to please get your Bible so you will see these things for yourselves. We don't just want you to take what we say here on this program and run with it. We want you to just study it for yourselves. Allow the Holy Spirit to just massage your mind as you go through the Word of God that you can arrive at truth because Jesus says that when he, that's the Holy Spirit, shall come, he will guide you into all truth. So that's the job of the Holy Spirit. That's the job of God in the third person of the Godhead. Verse 12 in Romans 7 says this, Wherefore, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. So we find that Paul here states about the, the commandment of God being holy, and not only just being holy, but good and just. So we find that if God's law is just, then it, there's nothing wrong with the law. And those who claim holiness 
has to keep the law because the law itself is holy. That's the add on that, buddy. You know, so much things to come to your mind. And we're describing the type of the personality of these God people. And one of the things it says about the personality of God is that they are saints and they keep, they are patient. You know, patient people, you know, we often are so busy and ready to run up and down. But it describes God to God patient people. And it's the people who are patient that are keeping the commandments of God. You go down in Revelation chapter 14, and verse 12, you get another idea of them. And, and why are God still so patient when you look at Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, it says here, and the dragon was roared with the woman and ran to make war with the remnant of her seed. You see, you have to be patient when someone is warned against you, but you have to what? keep loving them. You have to keep being compassionate towards them. And this is one of the things that God said. Those who love say, love thy neighbors as love as thyself was another commandment that he gave. The key is something say, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. And you cannot have love if you're not patient with people. And guess what? You cannot be help the you cannot help keep the commandment unless what? You are patient. You have to what? Endure trials. You see, and that's how God reinforced the commandment of his commandment in the word, the word of the Lord. And it goes on and says, and they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. In order to get that testimony of Jesus Christ. You have to be patient. Another one, if you go to uh, go to Romans chapter 11, verse 27, it gives another picture of these people who keep the commandment of God. And I love this one. It says, a blessing if ye what? Obey the commandment of the Lord your God, which I command you this day. You see, when you obey the Lord God's word, you are totally blessed. And this is the thing. In order to be blessed, you have to be patient. You have to be loving. And guess what? You have to be obedient. God wants of faith people who are obedient and those people who are faithful. So when you think about the attitude and you think about how the things are going to be, they're going to be people who are law-abiding. law, law abiding. They're going to be patient. They're going to be obedient to the will of the Lord, the, the Lord thy God. And we're not going to be people who are going to be rebellious. God is not a rebellious, like, um, like uh, God is not a rebellious. And his people is not going to be rebellious. They're going to be what? Obedient. And patient. In other words, they're going to be like Jesus. <laughs> All right, so let's look at question number two. Since most people today do not keep the Bible Sabbath, can we expect it will be restored? It says, They that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations and shalt be called the repairer of the breach the restorer of the path to dwell in. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord honorable, and thou shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words, then thou shalt delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father. For the mouth of the Lord had spoken it. Isaiah 58 verse 12 through 14. Just as in ancient times, God calls for his people to restore the trampled Sabbath to its rightful place. So he calls for its restoration today. And the restoration of all the commandments which are being trampled down. Let's read Revelation 14, and then we're going to look at verses 6, 7, 12. And let us add verse 14 to that. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell upon the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people. It goes on in verse 7, it says, Sing with a loud voice, fear God, and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. It goes on in front and says, and worship him that made the heavens and the earth, the sea and the fountain of water. Verse 12 says, here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. 14 goes on and says, and I look and behold a white cloud. And upon the cloud, one that sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. I love about that is verse um, six. And it says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, 
having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. So notice this is an everlasting gospel. So this isn't a new gospel. This is called the everlasting gospel. And we know um, God also shares that title of being everlasting. He is from everlasting to everlasting. And it says, um, verse 7, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. Now notice there's judgment attached to this message, right? There's a judgment. Um, Solomon said it also in Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14 that, and he says it this way, even though, even though um, John styles it this way, but Solomon actually too was telling you about the three angels' message. Um, in particular, this particular message, if you watch it very carefully, you will, hear, you will see it. Let's go right now. I'm, I'm, I still have my finger in Revelation chapter 14. But I want us quickly to turn into the Old Testament to see the same message here that Solomon is talking about that is similar or I should say the same message as John the Baptist because it is the everlasting gospel, right? Ecclesiastes chapter 12, the last chapter and verses 13 and 14. Here's what Solomon says. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. So notice, he says, this is the whole duty of man, right? The whole duty of man. Now, quickly, I just want us to look at that word man before we go any further. Because some people, you know, they say, oh, the Sabbath was for the Jews, the commandments were only for the Jews. But let's see if this word here, man, states Jew. So it's H in the Hebrew, if you have a, a concordance or an, a Bible on, on your computer or on your phone, and uh, with this, it can give me the strong concordant meaning right on the side of the word. So this word here is H or listed as H120 or H120. And it's called Adam, A-W-D-A-W-N, Adam, right? It sounds like Adam. And it means man or mankind, human being, right? So does it sound like it's talking about a Jew? Man Talking about humanity, right? Man. And then watch what he says now. Say, say, he says, for this is the whole duty of man or humanity. And Lord, watch what comes next. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So there's the same uh, judgment tone in his message that John is stating in his message in Revelation chapter 14, verse 7. For he says, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. So where do we find that? Where do we find that this God who will bring things into judgment? And notice he didn't just say any God. When he says, um, worship him, you, not that you know. In, their t in um, the time of the disciples, you had persons worshiping a lot of false gods and, and idols, right? And Paul talked about a few of those on his missionary journey. But here now, when John says, worship God, he then directs you to who God will be bringing you into judgment and who's the God who you must worship. The, the, he says, worship him that made heaven, earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. My friend, where do we find that God made these bodies? In fact, if you go to Exodus chapter 20, it'll actually tell us who this God is. Watch what God says. In Exodus chapter 20, in verse 1, we know that God is speaking to Moses, right? Because the first verse in chapter 20 says, and God spake all these words saying. So God spake all the words that's going to follow after verse 1. I want us to lock our minds though on verses 8 through 11. It says, remember the Sabbath day. Remember God is speaking now. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But... The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. 
In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made, watch this, the heaven, the earth, and the sea, and all that is within them, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So notice, as John stated, worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. God here says the exact same thing. He says, on the seventh day, you need to rest because I did something. I made the world, the earth, the sea, the fountains of waters. You go back to Genesis chapter two. Let's turn here now. I mean, you can finish read the rest of Exodus. I said eight to 11, but I just want us to catch the point here where John is saying that we need to worship him that made the heaven and earth. And then Exodus actually shows us that it was God who did this. And now we're going to um, see where did God do this. In Exodus chapter 2, from verse 1, 2, and 3, it says, Thus the heaven, watch that again, and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. So I say, Brother Carly, that is, that is quite clear. Solomon says there's going to be a judgment and that we need to keep the whole humanity, needs to keep God's holy day, inclusive of the other nine commandments. And then John says that we need to worship him that made heaven and earth the sea and the fountains of waters. Then we go back to Exodus and God tells this mixed multitude now, because it's not just Jews, mind you, because a lot of people forget that there were some Egyptians who saw what was going on in Egypt and joined the band that was leaving Egypt. And so even if they may have paid crazy and don't know this true God, God showed them exactly who he was from the, the plagues that were falling in Egypt. Then, he at Mount Sinai told that mixed multitude who he is and what he's about with his own mouth. And then he wrote on two tables of stone, right? And then in Genesis, it points us to God in creation. And if you go to Hebrews to add another text, that if you go to Hebrews chapter four, verse four, Paul doesn't point you to Jesus. He points you back to creation. He points you back to God in creation. In fact, let's look at it. I'm going to pull this one up on the screen because I, I, I hear some people say too, oh, Jesus is my Sabbath. And they try to use Hebrews chapter 4. So we'll, let's look at it and see if that is the case. Let's see if that's the case. I'm going to share my screen here. Hebrews chapter 4 and see what Paul says. Verse 4. And it says, For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. And God did rest the seventh day from all his works. So notice Paul says, God did rest. Which points you back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. This doesn't point you to Jesus, my friend. Now, we know that Jesus is the creator. And Jesus himself said in Mark chapter 2, verse 27, let us go there really quickly. Mark 2, verse 27, and verse 28. And here what Jesus says, Jesus actually agrees with Paul, right? Watch what he says, last two verses. I'm going to highlight it. I'm gonna try to highlight it. And he said unto them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, or conclusion, the son of man is Lord also of the Sabbath. So Jesus is saying, I am Lord of man and I am also Lord of the Sabbath. For both were created in the world perfect before sin. And let's look at this word man here. 
I want us to look at that key word here in verse 27. Let's see if that spells Jew. Let's see if that means Jew, right? Or Hebrew. Let, let's find out what that man is there. Now, fortunately, this Bible here gives me the meaning of the Greek and Hebrew on the side. So you can see um, verse 27 here is highlighted. And the word man is G44. Four, and this is what it says, right? Anthropos. Let's see what anthropos means. It says a human, a human being, man. So notice it didn't say Jew, right? It doesn't say Jew, but it actually says man. So which once again, Jesus is saying, I've made humanity and I've made the Sabbath. And humanity is to obey my voice my commandments and rest on the day that i have chosen from creation how do we know because here's what paul says in romans and sorry not romans hebrews chapter 4 going back again to chapter 4 and he says in verse e verse i'm going to read from verse 5 and and in this place again if they shall enter into my rest, into my rest, talking about the, the verse before, verse four says, on the seventh day, God ended his work, right? And then he says, if they'd enter into his rest, seeing therefore, verse six, it remained that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Now we know that's talking about those who came out of Egypt. So if they didn't enter in this rest, because remember, before Mount Sinai, they were tested on the Sabbath. They were tested in, in Exodus chapter 16, and God's word was to Moses to see if they would keep his ways or no. So we know that the Sabbath wasn't nothing new to them, because the word that uh, in verse 8 starts with the word, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Why would you remember something you've never known? So that means they had to have known. But where did the information come from? Because we just see God giving them the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai in, in chapter 20. Which means that in order for God to say, remember to keep the Sabbath day, that means they had to have known, which means this information had to have been handed down to them. And how did they know our marriage work? How did they know? Where did they get that knowledge from? Who did we see teaching them about marriage? In fact, right after Cain killed Abel, we saw Cain got married. But where did he get that information from? He wasn't in the garden. It was handed down. He would have known because it was taught him. Just like the Sabbath would have been taught him because both institutions started in perfection, started in the garden. It's amazing. Uh, it's amazing, Brother Carl. And I, I mean, it's just mind-blowing to see how if we take our time to go through the scriptures, it will speak for itself. That's the beauty of the Bible. It speaks for itself. It's very clear. And we think most people just want to say rest, but the word, the Bible actually, when it talks about the Sabbath, is more than a rest. And as we were talking about repair of the bridge, we were preparing ourselves to come back to God. God wants us to come back to Him. So He created a space and time where we can have a fellowship with Him. And one of the texts that, um, as we were reading and as we were explaining them, so you did it so clearly, I don't even have to go too much in depth. So I'm just going to go with one more text, and I'm going to go right to the Isaiah chapter 66, verses 22 and 23. And listen, listen to what it says. Don't jump, don't jump now. Let me, let me let the audience see this on the screen. For those who may not have their Bibles um, readily available. Isaiah 66? Yes, yes Isaiah 66, verses 23, 22 and 23. You know, it's very important that we understand what is the, what is the Sabbath is all about. Because mm -hmm. many of us, we could go home, anybody could go home and rest. Anybody can go home and do whatever. But this rest mm -hmm. actually means more than that. This rest actually means to abide in Christ. You see, we have to abide in our Lord and Savior. And as we abide in our Lord and Savior, there's something else that we need to do. It goes on and says in Isaiah chapter 66, verse 22 and 23. And I'm going to read it to you. It says, For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I shall make, shall remain before me, said it the Lord. So shall, the, so shall your seed and your name remain. 
And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, that is the Lord. You see, the Sabbath is just not a rest. It is a time for what? To worship. Probably Give God the honor. Give him the, the dues that is due unto him. That's why it's in, in, um, we read it earlier and we talk about it in Revelation and it talks about, um, here's another angel flying in the midst of heaven, fair God, but he's the one who created the heavens and the earth because what he's calling us back to, to worship the one who has created us, the one who has created the heaven and earth that gives us a place to dwell in. So we are now paying homage to the one who has created us. Now, guess what? We not only have to pay homage for him because he created us, we have to pay humans from because what? He have redeemed us from sin. So this Sabbath is actually what? We are abiding in his peace. We are taking off all our labor. We're taking off the sin burden. And he say, who are heavy laden? He's taking away the sin from us. That's why he's the Lord of the Sabbath. Because he's the one who's going to give us the peace. He's the one who's going to be the one to give us a peace that surpasses all our understanding. We have to understand that God is calling all flesh to worship him. If we get anything from Isaiah 66, verse 22 and 23, learn this part. It says, from one no one to another, and from one Sabbath to another, and this is what? This is coming from, from a new heaven and a new earth. You will still be doing this. And guess what? Shall all flesh come before the Lord to worship him? Amen. So guess what you're going to be doing? You're still going to be worshiping him on the Sabbath day in the new earth, and the new heaven. Amen. Amen. Definitely true. So let us look. As I talk about restoration. By whom will the Sabbath be restored and how? It says the Sabbath is restored by those who keep it. They will be called the repairer of the breach. The restorer of paths to dwell in. When the enemy attacked the wall towns anciently. They would endeavor to make a breach in the walls. Then the battle would rage around that spot. So, you know, I can agree with that 100% because it seems as if, if we look at the Sabbath as, as, as a wall, the, the Ten Commandments, just what everyone agrees with all nine, you know, they believe that they should have no other God outside of God. They believe they should not make any idols and images uh, and worship them, pay them adoration. For the most part, most Christians believe that you shouldn't take God's name in vain or handle his name loosely. Uh, and that's, I mean, even going deeper in that on, on the surface level, you know, that's what they believe. But it, it always goes deeper than that, right? They believe that you should honor your father and mother. You shouldn't disrespect them. You should live up to the father's name and you, you should do your, mother's, your mother proud. Take care of your parents. You know, they, they, for the most part, believe that. When it comes to thou should not kill, most believe that. They shouldn't, you know, take an innocent life. For the most part, those who believe in the institution of a marriage, as it is between one man and one woman, holy man and holy woman at that. They believe they should be, you know, one unit, that they should be faithful one to another. Most believe that. Most believe you shouldn't steal, you shouldn't take things that doesn't belong to you. Most believe you shouldn't lie. Most believe you shouldn't cover your neighbor's things, their property. But when it comes to that fourth commandment, there seems as if there's an issue across the, the, the Christian board. It seems as if people just don't understand or want to understand the significance of the Sabbath, the fourth commandment. And the fourth commandment is actually the seal, as we spoke about in our last uh, episode of those who want to see that in Engage 2.0. I will leave a link uh, in the description so you can follow up. And, you know, we are building uh, from our previous program. So if you're seeing this and may not understand it, um, we're going to um, ask you to go into our previous um, program so you can, you know, get the information and bring yourself up to speed. So it, this could be more clear to you if it's not that clear. But 
the seal of God is embedded into the fourth commandment. And that actually tells us, as, as the question states, we restore the Sabbath when we keep it. You know, you cannot honor a marriage if you're not faithful in that marriage. Just the same way um, for you to restore that which was broken, you have to keep it. And it's amazing to see that most people believe that, you know, they say I'm a Christian, but they don't follow the ways of Christ. You, Christ, as his custom was, scripture says, he was in the synagogues on the Sabbath. You know, he's doing good. He actually told his disciples, told the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Jews who were following him constantly looking for some reason to accuse him. Isn't it right to do good on the Sabbath days? Why would he ask that question if they were already doing that, which they claimed he, he was breaking? You know, the, they thought he was breaking the Sabbath. They kept accusing him of breaking the Sabbath. As he healed persons, as he healed individuals, they kept saying, this man can't be of God, but he bro broke the Sabbath. It's, it's like, why do you think helping someone, healing someone, is breaking the Sabbath? There's something twisted in their thinking. There's something twisted in their thinking. And for, for those Jews back in those days who went to the extreme, in some of their laws, you could not so much as spit on the, on the grass because they call that irrigating. You know, if my, if my brother, you know, for some reason has a wound and I'm wearing a white t-shirt, and I take and split my t-shirt in half to tie up his wound to stop the bleeding or to slow the bleeding, they would say, oh, you're dying the cloth. You know, all kind of ri ridiculous things they came up with and they thought that, that th these things were works. But Jesus, isn't it good to do good on the Sabbath? And so this is where the confusion comes in. Jesus is showing them how the law is to be kept. And they are trying to tell Jesus how the law should be kept. And you know, notice that? So they are saying, this is how we keep it. And Jesus said, no, this is the way my father's on it when you keep his Sabbath commandment. You know, Freddy, I was listening, and it's, it's almost really funny. How could you tell the Lord of the Sabbath how to keep the Sabbath? You understand? <laughs> you know, but you know, one of the things that we have learned over the years, and when we study the children of Israel, not even just the children of Israel, when we study the human race, we learn that whenever men go against the Sabbath, they become what? In bondage. And why do men go in bondage? God is trying to teach us something. You know what he's trying to teach us? Every time we go against or we rebel against God or separate ourselves from God, we are what? We are going into sin. So what do you have to do? You have to break the sin barrier to what? Heal us. And when we are healed, guess what we do? We restore the old work, the old broke down waste place. You know, in Ezra 9 and 9, when the children of Israel were free, from the Babylonian captive. This is what this, this is what it just said. For well, we were bond men. You see that they were bond because they were what captive. When you're in rebellion and when you're against God, you are bond men. He goes and says, Yet God had not forsaken us in our bondage, but had extended mercy unto us in the sight of the king of Persia. So mm. the king of Persia was what a type of the deliverer of like God. He's like Jesus to deliver the people from what their bondage, from their sin. And remember what God said. You are heavy laden. What? I will give you what? Rest. rest. Goes on and goes and says to give us a. And the answer continues. He says to give us a reviving, to set up the host of our God, and to repair the desolation thereof, and to give us a wall in Judah and in Jerusalem. Why is given this wall in Judah and Jerusalem? So what? They could go back to repair the old waste place or to restore the worship of their true God. If you don't believe that, it goes down further. I'm going to show you something else. But it started to highlight it. But if you read Ezra, you know that one of the reasons why the children of Israel were restoring Jerusalem is what? To go back to worship their God. I'm going to show you another one that better you highlight. Not only is God in the Sabbath restoring us to worship, he's restoring us to good health. Listen to what this says in Luke chapter 13, verse 15, verse, and verse 16. And Brother Edie highlighted this. I'm going to read it, the text to actually just to compliment or to comment or to go along with just what he just said. It says here, the Lord then answered and said, thou hypocrites, do it not each one of you on the Sabbath day lose your ox and your donkey from the store and lead, men, lead him away to water? And ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has born, same thing because remember we were in bondage because of our sin. 
who say not born, lo, these 18 years. The children of Israel have been in, in, in bondage for how much? 400 years? Mm. He goes on and says, be loose from this bond on what? The Sabbath day. You see, when God restores man, he's restoring you to physical health too. This Amen. is all the blessings and the healing is in the Sabbath. Amen. And we think, we think when we don't obey God's will, that we're going to be blessed. Every time the children of Israel or man disobey God, they go what? Into bondage. And every time they go back and they start holding the principle of God, guess what he does? He frees them. He loots them from bondage. And that's what the Sabbath does for us. When you come into God's word, when you come into God's teaching, you are what? Restoring the part. You're given life that the Father has given you to another person by Jesus Christ. You are restoring them to make it right with their Lord and their Savior. You bring back health. You bring in mental sanity. And not only that, you bring them back spiritual growth and strength. Amen. So let us go to our fourth question now. Whom did God charge with the breaking of his law in ancient times? Let us go to Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 26. Ezekiel verse 26 reads. I don't know if anybody want to pull that up on the screen also. Yeah, let's, let's, let's pull that up. It's a very powerful text. It, hi it highlights something very important. And I think he should pull it up. I want us to take play close attention to Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 26, what it says. It says here, a priest have violated my law. You hear that? Mm -hmm. A priest have violated my law. And I perform my holy things. Could that be like the Sabbath? They have performed God's holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and the profane. Neither have they shewed the difference between the unclean and the clean. And I've hid their eyes from the Sabbath and have, and I am profane among them. And these are what? How priests. priests. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They cannot discern between the holy and the profane. They cannot preserve between the unclean and clean. Wow. But yet you call yourself teachers. Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to go further back and show you something. And it became a text that I actually had to take, take good heed to. It says Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30 and 31. And it says something that I want us to wake up to when we think about these things, when we are listening to the word of God and when we are not uh, complying to the word of God and not sharing or teaching people how to live for God. What, text, says, that, like, what, what text is that? That's Ezekiel. Uh -huh. Ezekiel 22, verse 30 to 31. All right, so just further down. 22 or 30, 32? 22. Uh -huh. Verse chapter 22, verse 30 to 31. All right. And listen what right. it says here. Uh -huh. And I thought for a man among them that shall make up the edges. Oh, be restorers and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. Remember, Abraham said, God, if there was what? 40, 50, mm -hmm. 30, mm -hmm. 10, mm -hmm. righteous. Mm -hmm. Goes on mm -hmm. and says, and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none. Wow. Therefore, I will pour my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my rod. Their own way have I recommended upon their heads, said it the Lord God. You see what happened when you don't obey God? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That to teach the word of God. You have to make it clear. You cannot be dumb dogs that don't bark. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, it, it reminds me of Aaron because Aaron actually ended up being, and, and I know God did that for a reason, because he was responsible for them being led into idol worship. And they came to him and say, "Up, oh, let's go, buddy. Make us some God so we could worship them. Because this Moses, we ain't know what's going on up there. But we need some God worship down here. And so Aaron instructed them to break off the goals that are on them. And he took them and he fashioned them into a golden cow. So Aaron was responsible and he ended up being a high priest. So Aaron actually, um, here, when we look at leadership and look at the priest, 
we see nothing different than what had happened in the beginning. And so um, it's amazing to see that the leadership, if they are not, if they are not um, strong enough to see evil and to call sin by its name and to have persons or their congregation to stand on God's word, but cave into pressure. That's what happened with Aaron. He, he caved into pressure and he didn't stand for God. And Moses was wroth. Moses actually stood in the gap because God on Mount Sinai was ready to, to do away with those who broke his law. And Moses, the type of Christ standing in the gap, because remember the same thing happened in the garden when Adam and Eve transgressed God's law. However simple it may have seemed, this is why Jesus tells us that we are to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, not out of the mouth of man. So when God told Adam not to eat and Adam was to transmit that same um, command to his wife, when they didn't follow suit, they broke God's law. Simply put. And God ceases into is, is, um, his communication. Jesus stepped in. The same way how we saw Moses stepped in, when the children of Israel were um, worshiping a golden idol, God said to Moses, I'm about to destroy this people and start a new people through you or through his loins. And Moses had reminded him, no, 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 sir. These are the people that you brought out of Egypt. These are your children. Remember your promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so the Lord repented. The Lord repented. And so the same thing what we saw in um in in the account with Moses on the mount dealing with the children of Israel in their transgression is the same thing that we have we would have seen with God and Jesus about Adam and Eve. He stepped in. This is why something died in the garden to cover their naked bodies. Remember, they hid themselves and then um they stood before God in fig leaves. And God had to clothe them. Jesus had to clothe them in, co in coats of skin, symbolizing something died to give them the skin. And so, my friends, we are the ones who are standing in the gap. We have to stand in the gap and say, no, this is what the will of God says. This is what the word of God says. Now, mind you, you don't have to accept it. But this is what the word says. Because even in the days of the disciples, when they preached certain places, some people didn't hear what they wanted to say. And Jesus told them, shake off the very dust from your feet because that dust will be in evidence against them in the time of judgment. And so this program, you might not like what's being said, but we implore you to at least research the things that are said in this program and to see if they're not so. Let us go in question number five now. What was God looking for someone to do? What was God looking for someone to do? Um, let us go to, I think you touched on it already, but you know, let's just for the sake of question and answering, let's go to it. Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30. And it says, and I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But found none, as we stated already, um, he found none to stand in the gap which means everyone turned their own way. Everyone did their own thing and went against the law of God. This is nothing new. We saw this in Jeremiah. They didn't want to hear what Jeremiah had to say. By the way, there was never a prophet, hear me well, there was never a prophet that the people, the children of Israel loved. Never. Jesus told them straight, you kill it to prophets. They killed Jesus. <laughs> so, you know, there was never a prophet that a message to turn and repent from their evil way that they liked. They love to have their own way. And there's nothing new of today. They will still kill the prophet. They will still kill because they don't want to hear God has a standard. Brother Didi, that's not going to change. We also have rebellious people in the earth. You know, but the good job of us, the job of the leaders of the church, the job of those who accept the gospel is to teach and to and just say it. Because guess what? Let God be on your head if you don't say it. But if you teach and if you try 
to let the word of God come up to someone, there's hope. There's a chance that that person might make a decision to turn to God. I want to leave another thought what the Bible says when we don't do what God says. In Psalm 68, verse 23, and it gives a very interesting picture of what happened to those that don't do the will of the God. Psalm 68, verse 23. I'm going to read it to you. And it said that thy foot may be dipped in the blood of thy enemies and the tongues of thy dog in the same. In other words, when you do not do the will of the Lord, your enemies are going to be dipping in their foot in your blood. And the dog is going to be drinking up your blood with their tongue. So you become what? A cast away when you don't do the will of God. We don't want to be a cast away. We don't want to be put aside because we did not listen to the word of God. We want to be those who stand in the gap before. What text that was? Before. That was um, Psalm 68, verse 23. 6 8. 68. Yeah, I want, I want, I want to see that. I want to see that. I want them to see that on screen. You know. 68, you said, right? Yes, yeah, so it's 23. All right. Uh, and it says, the Lord, hold on, I want to, okay. That the foot may be dipped in the blood of thine enemies and the tongue of thy dogs in the steam. Wow. Brothers and sisters, this, this is a calling. This is the, this is a task that sales tells us that when we are obedient, God have a blessing on us. I said it to you earlier, blessed are those that keep the commandments of God. For those who rebel, you are like a castaway. This, you are now put aside as dumb. Do not be a castaway. At least be a child of God and have hope. You can see the New Jerusalem. You can be saved by our Lord and Savior. That's why that text is so important. And I probably should read it again so you can understand where I'm coming from. It says this. That what? Therefore have I poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my rod. Their own way have I recommended unto their heads, said it the Lord God. He's, your own ways are destroying you. But if you stand in the way, you could be a repairer of the bridge. You could be the one who can stand in the gap. You could be the one who's, who hold up the gospel banner and spread it and teach it to others. And that's what God wants. When you are a child of God, you have patience and you keep God's commandment. You know, um, just looking at the reference to dogs eating the same that the enemies shall trample um, or walk in the blood. You know, I was looking back at Jezebel in Second Kings chapter nine, verse thirty-five to thirty-seven, and it says, "And they went, and they went to bury her, but they found no more of her than the skull and the feet, and the palms of her hands." Now, if you think about that, if you think about that, the skull, the hands, and the feet. Doesn't it remind you of something happening to someone revolving around the head, the hands, and the feet? And it says, Wherefore they came again and told them and said, This is the word of the Lord, which he spake by his servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, In the portion of Jezreel shall dogs eat the flesh of Jezebel, and the carcass of Jezebel shall be as dung upon the face of the field in the portion of Jezreel. So that they shall not say this is Jezebel. And Jezebel uh, was a daughter of a king who married the king um, Ahaz, or Ahab, sorry, Ahab, king of uh, Israel at the time, and which led the king into rebellion against God. And a false priest came in, a false prophet, and they slew uh, or started to do away with God's true priests. Uh, and, you know, and prophets, and then you know, Elijah escaped out of their hands. But God had seven thousand. 
didn't bow the knee to Baal. And so even though they were hidden from Jezebel, but Jezebel represents that entity that, that turned the king away from truth. And so there was nothing left of her because the dogs ate her. And dogs represents unbelievers as well in scripture. But it just so, so happens that when you don't stand for truth, uh, you will be as a dog. Because even in Revelation chapter 22, uh, tells us that there will be dogs outside the city of the New Jerusalem. There will be dogs. And that's a reference to unbelievers, those who didn't accept the, the truth of God. And it's just amazing how um, we find in these last days that this is going to be an issue. The, the, all the commandments are going to be an issue, but in particular, the, the fourth commandment, because that's the one that God has in, encased his seal, his identity in the fourth commandment. All right, so let's look at our last question for today. In ancient times, when men should have been repairing the breach made in Judah's religion, what were they doing? Let's look at Ezekiel chapter 13 and verse 10. It's another powerful text, you know, and we have this going on in our society today. Um, people preaching what we call itchy ears, smooth words, you know, and smooth things. Ezekiel chapter 13, verse 10. I don't know if you want to pull that up too, Eddie. Let's do that. Let's just, we, are, we are not here entertaining. Um, we want people to switch these things out. So um, we're going to put it on the screen. Yes. Okay. Let's let see. Let them see this for themselves. This one is very important because this is something that we, we tend to overlook or pass by. Mm -hmm. But this is something that we definitely need to take in great consideration. All right. Highlight it. Go ahead. It says, yeah, because, because even because they have seduced my people, mm. seducing God's people with what? Itchy ears, sweet words, promises that they, you know, things that God is not going to do this. God is not going to hurt you. God is going to let you live. You can live in your sin. God don't teach that. Seducing my people saying peace. And there was what? No, no peace. peace. How many times in the Bible we have people preaching peace? And then there's a war. Jeremiah was preaching and they saying Jeremiah is crazy. And the children of Israel still get caught up in Babylon, taken to Babylon. And he say, and one build up a wall and lo, another double it with untempted moral. People are people are doing their own thing. You know, this is we have to be careful what we come when we are teaching and when we are preaching the word of God. If it doesn't say, thus says the Lord, or come from God, don't say it. Just leave it alone. Because you're only going to find yourself saying things that's untrue. Things that don't want to line up with the scriptures. You know, um, there's a scripture also. Uh, Jesus spoke. And, some, you know, sometimes we try to separate the God of the New Testament from Jesus. And say, well, you know, God was, you know, uh, uh, ordered genocide and God was, you know, um, you know, kind of harsh. And then Jesus was loving and kind. But here's, what, here's Jesus' words. Uh, in fact, let me pull it up. This is Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. And it's in red. So we know that's his, Jesus speaking. I'm going to look at 51. Okay, and it says here, from verse 51, it says, ah, let me see if I can make this a little bigger here. Yeah, because it's a little hard to see. All right. Uh, should be a little better. Okay, it says, suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth. I tell you, nay. What did Jesus say? He said, you think nay. I come to bring peace on earth? He said, no. No, I didn't. He's a but rather division. What? Yeah. Uh, hold on. We're talking about a time when there's ecumenism. We're talking mm -hmm. about a time where churches are coming together on this common yeah. brotherhood bond. We, we're, yeah. co we're talking about persons putting away their doctrinal differences to be on one accord. That's right. Negating the Holy Spirit because remember, Peter just wasn't up in the upper room, kumbaya in, 
in a, some kind of trance trying to be on one accord. No, actually, Peter Lewis were putting away their differences. Yes. Their biases. Yes. And they were looking at the cause of God and being on one accord in God's cause, not their own agenda. So here Jesus says, I hope you see this is Jesus. Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth. I tell you, nay, but rather division. For from henceforth, there shall be five in one household, three against two and two against three. The father shall be divided against the son and the son against the father, the mother against the daughter and the daughter against the mother, the mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Look, are we trying to say Jesus is trying to cause some royal rumble here? Is this like some <laughs> WWE match where they're going to be a, a, a three on three or a two on three kind of situation? Why is Jesus saying this? Why is he says, um, um, why is it pro, um, at his birth, his first coming, peace on earth and, and good goodwill is. toward men? But now he's saying in Luke 12, 51, you think I come to bring peace on earth? He's like, no, I didn't come to bring peace, but rather division. But let's further read in context what he's talking about before we think Jesus is a hypocrite. And he said also to the people, when ye see a cloud rise out of the west, straightway ye say, there cometh the shower. And so it is. And when ye see south, the south wind blow, ye say, there, there will be heat. And it cometh to pass. Ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky and of yeah. the earth. But how is it that ye do not discern, do time. not discern this time? But what time is that? The time of Jesus' sec- um, first coming. What is Jesus referring to? He's saying, you don't know the time of your, of your coming. In fact, John the Baptist actually told them to make way for the Lord to travel. But what was John the Baptist talking about? If you go back into the narrative, John actually telling them, who told them to flee from the wrath that was to come? In other words, there was a judging that was going to happen amongst God's people. There was a time of reckoning that God's people would have been judged. In fact, Jesus told Peter 70 times seven. That goes yeah. back to prophecy. That deep in and of itself. And we're going to cover more of that as, this, as we go on. But it, it suffice to say that Jesus says, I did not come to bring peace. My word shall separate you from the sinner. They says the, he says, the world does not love me, neither will it love you. If you are of the world, the world will love you because the world loveth its own. That's right. so those who are with God, the world will hate you. And if you are in a household of sinners, because we all are sinners, according to Romans 5, 8, Christ died for us while we were all sinners. So no one can claim that we are superior one over the other. No, Jesus died for us while we were all in sin, my friends. Let us not get... But here, the the Bible is teaching that when one accepts Christ, the world will be against you because the world has the spirit of the enemy. Wow. You know, Brady, Brady, you know, when you, as you was going through that, and I was thinking to to myself, you know, the peace that God brings is that the salvation was come to all man. Mm-hmm. And that was the peace. And guess what? It became a sword because they rejected. And the division became because one would accept it and the other one won't. Right. And we go through these things and we hear these words. This division, because those who have a rebellious spirit cannot be in the person of life. They are at war with God. That's why the Bible said in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, we have empathy. Right. Right. You see? And we have to understand that when you have someone accepting the word of God and those who don't want to be of the like mind or who are of a rebellious spirit, you have a problem. The problem is they're going to hate you. They're going to hate you because you want to live for God. And when that happens, you are now become an enemy because a different spirit is controlling them. Right. And that's, the, that's, the, that's where the war comes from. That's the division. The division is one spirit is of God and the other spirit of what? Of Satan. Of Satan. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, in, in, sorry, go ahead. And two cannot agree. 
Because remember, Paul says, "My the um he said one spirit um the flesh wars against my what spirit." These things, these are the things that we are fighting against. These are the things that we are struggling with. And not only just with people, but in ourselves. So, brothers and sisters, we have to understand that this word of God is coming not to not to kill us if we accept it. But if we don't, trust me, it will fall on you. All right, so you have any final thoughts as we wrap up this episode? I, I have, a, you know, one of the things I want to leave with us is that it's good to be in the house of our Lord and our Savior. It's good to be a child of God. It's good to present the gospel of God. Let us be repairs of the bridge. Let us tell somebody what, what the Sabbath and keeping the commandment of God really does for those who have kept it. How it have enlightened and enriching their minds and enriching their souls and made them become better person in society, not only because of being a good citizen, because of their, their humage or their allegiance to their Lord and Savior. You know, we are not to sit by idle, is my other point. We are to be one to present the gospel, not the false gospel, but the gospel of Jesus Christ in its purest form that someone out there who is dying in sin can be restored to his Lord and Savior. Amen. You know, um, I'm going to close. I want us to take a look at this picture as we close. Just so you can get an idea of what what we're driving at here. And you see on the screen, the picture shows someone repairing the wall and the other is tearing it down. And the question is asked, which side are you on? Which side are you on? Are you repairing the breach that was made in God's law? Or are you breaking the wall, the hedge down? In conclusion, some have wondered whether it was possible to keep God's law. Read Revelation 14, 12 again. John mentions four characteristics of God's people. First, they have patience. That is, they endure and are steadfast. Second, they are holy and sanctified, which is the meaning of, of a saint. Third, they keep all ten commandments. Fourth, they have the faith of Jesus. Do all Christians have faith in Christ? Evidently not, for Jesus said, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Luke 6, 46 Faith and obedience must never be separated. My friends, I pray that this study has been a blessing to you. And if you have any thoughts, comments, or questions, please you can send those to Heart to Heart Ministries at 242 at gmail.com there we will be happy to get your your thoughts, comments, or your questions relating to today's topic. Or if you have any uh, anything that you want us to weigh in on our program, you can also send it to us as well. Also, you'll be able to find this um, this broadcast on YouTube. And we are also looking at new platforms to launch these programs. As we know. Um, it seems as if truth is an irritation to those who want to bury it. And um, a lot of platforms, uh, your programs may be taken off because of the truth that's being shared and they don't want, uh, Satan doesn't want you to know. But we're going to do our endeavor best to make sure we get the word out for this gospel of the kingdom must go through all the world. Then shall the end come. This has been Engage 3.0 for my co-host, 
Brother Colin, and for myself, Brother Edie, say until next time, God's willing, Maranatha. <laughs>